I am thrilled to welcome you all here and to also introduce our speakers for the session, John and Megan. And the session is called Impact and Iteration, Improving Healthcare Through Clinical Research MOOC. Uh, we invite you to participate in the chat throughout the session, and we'll also have a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. So without further ado, over to our speakers. Welcome, Megan and John. Thank you, Marin. Hi, everybody. Uh, good to be here. Um, I'll just introduce myself and then I'll, I'll pass over to John. So I'm Megan Kime, I'm Interim Director of the Digital Education Service at the University of Leeds. Um, and I'll say a little bit more uh, a, a slightly later on in the presentation about our service and, and how we've partnered with NAHR. Uh, but I'll pass over to John to introduce himself. Oh, you're muted, John. Um, <laughs> okay. Um... Ah, there we are. You've given me control again. Thank you. <laughs> so again, um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining this sort of session. As Megan sort of says, delighted to have this opportunity to present to you this morning about the work that we've been doing with sort of MOOCs. Um, if you are watching the recording, we have got our email addresses at the end of the slides. Um, so if you aren't able to obviously ask questions live, we'd be very happy to have those sort of questions offline sort of afterwards. So without any sort of further ado, uh, firstly, let me introduce myself. My, my name is John Castledine. I'm head of learning in the Clinical Research Network, which is part of the National Institute for Health and Care Research. A little bit of a mouthful and um, probably needs a little bit of an explanation. So uh, I'll start off by giving a little bit of an explanation about who are the NIHR. Now, if I'd asked this question three years ago, I'm sure there would have been blank faces all around the room. Uh, hopefully, with the um, pandemic, uh, the NIHR's role has become much more visible in terms of what we do across England and sort of beyond in terms of enabling and delivering world-leading health sort of research and care research as well. Uh, so you do see a, a number of members from the NIHR appearing in national sort of media, certainly over the last sort of three years. The National Institute for Health Research is, however, a virtual organisation it's made up by a series of contracts that are issued by the Department of Health and Social Care. And it's one of those contracts that was issued to the University of Leeds, along with Guy's and St. Thomas's for running the clinical research network, uh, which is why you, you sort of see myself and, and Megan come together today to talk about the MOOCs that we've been running, a partnership between the National Institute for Health Research and our host, the University of Leeds. Uh, and just before I move on to the next slide, one thing I would really like to acknowledge is that health research is only possible through the efforts of patients, carers, members of the public that co-create the research with us and volunteer to take part in research studies. So a critical part of the research infrastructure is public uh, and, and patients alongside obviously the researchers that we support. So why MOOCs? Why are we interested in MOOCs? Why have MOOCs been a really useful sort of tool uh, that we've been deploying in the National Institute for Health and Care Research? Well, firstly, our role is to support the NHS and other organisations build and maintain the capacity and capability of the research workforce. And particularly in the clinical research network, we're focused on those that are delivering research in hospitals in clinics, in GP surgeries, in pharmacies, and sort of elsewhere. So we look to support that network of uh, individuals across the whole of the country. But of course, it's wider than that as well. We really need to engage with the full uh, clinical and healthcare sort of workforce. Your GP may be the person that could alert you to a study that may be suitable for you. Likewise, the pharmacist. Equally, we want to ensure that as many clinicians as possible are aware of careers in research and can, the role that they can sort of play, um, if you will, balancing a clinical role with their sort of research role. And again, I come back to the critical role of uh, patients and members of the public in partnering with us in any sort of research sort of study. And just to give you a sort of sense of some of the numbers, the research delivery workforce that we directly support is of the region of 10 to 15,000 people spread across England. The wider research workforce in England is at least 40,000, if not sort of more you know, clinical sort of professionals. 
Of course, the wider clinical and healthcare sort of workforce runs into millions. And as you can see on the slide there, through the peak of the pandemic of, of COVID, 1.4 million participants were enrolled on studies that we were coordinating within the clinical research network. And of course, that was up on the previous year, but in a, if you will, a normal year when we were looking at some research which wasn't around COVID, over 700,000 individuals participating in directly in research that we were supporting. So in addition to formal education that we sort of support, in addition to what members of the public may learn through social media, there's a key role for us to engage using the channel of MOOCs in terms of its open access, which is fantastic for engaging these large numbers of uh, people, both clinical professionals and members of the public, bringing greater awareness about what is health research and the different roles that individuals can play. So a little bit of an introduction to the NIHR and why we fit into the system with the University of Leeds. As I say, it's been a really great partnership with colleagues across the University of Leeds to make it live the, the MOOCs and really bring the advantages of MOOCs into the NIHR. So with that, I'll turn to Megan to talk a little bit about the Digital Education Service. Thanks, John. Um, so, so just very briefly, um, colleagues may or may not know, um, University of Leeds is one of the founding partners of Future Learning. Future Learning is the platform that the MOOCs that uh, we'll be talking about in a little bit more detail uh, run on. Um, and the Digital Education Service at, at Leeds has developed over 120 courses for that uh, for the platform since its launch in 2013. Um, the portfolio of courses that we've developed and that we have run are for a number of different purposes. So um, some of the key things that we have tried to do with the courses that we've developed include um, courses aimed at uh, pre-university, so 16 to 18 year olds thinking about university study, either to um, help them understand a little bit more about the subjects that they might be wanting to study, but also uh, for skills development to help them uh, with that move up into uh, undergraduate study. Then also courses aimed at our own students and undergraduate students uh, elsewhere for, for skills development or uh, indeed for them to think about transition to uh, taught postgraduate study. And then um, courses for kind of professional learning or, or continuing professional development uh, in various different sectors. But most relevantly for our partnership with the NIHR, we've also seen a really uh, important role uh, that the platform and the courses we develop can play in public engagement and research dissemination uh, and knowledge transfer. And the partnership that um, John has spoken about uh, with the NIHR has been one of our really uh, most successful examples of that model. So working with partner organisations uh, to support their public engagement activity using the medium of um, open online courses to reach a broader audience and to engage them in understanding um, in, a, in a deeper way than might be possible through other mechanisms. So in this case, engaging uh, key audiences with understanding what health research is and how they might engage with it and what that might mean. Um, and we have some other uh, partnerships in the areas of digital skills and also in uh, kind of arts and cultural organisations. And then I'll, um, uh, so I'm going to pass back to John who will talk in more detail about the courses and how they've been developed, etc. But we'll just say at the end about how um, we've then uh, kind of continued to partner with uh, NIHR and others to think about the evaluation um, of the impact of courses and, and then use that uh, to further our work. But I'll pass back to John now. Thanks, Megan. And we, we titled this presentation Impact and Iteration, and we really want to sort of bring alive the impact that this MOOC has had for us. But also, as you'll sort of see in a moment, we've introduced more recently a second sort of MOOC, and that allows us to do a little bit of a compare and contrast between these two um, courses, and that helps us with the iteration. So if I start with the long-standing sort of MOOC, a massive open online sort of course that we've been running, Improving Healthcare Through Clinical Research, we launched this not long after the University of Leeds, along with Guys and St. Thomas's, won the contract to operate the Clinical Research Networks Coordinating Centre. So this launched back in November 2015, 
and as Megan sort of says, um, through the University of Leeds working closely as a partner with Future Learn, uh, this course has sort of sat on the Future Learn sort of pro, um, platform. Since its launch in at uh, the very end of 2015, over 46,000 learners have enrolled on the course. And as you can sort of see by some of the sort of stats there, it has been very well regarded in terms of the sort of various sort of ratings, very sort of positive sort of feedback that we've got from the course. It was structured, uh, is structured as a four week course. And if, any, uh, if somebody wants to work through all the activities, a, a typical learner will probably take four hours per week. So 16 hours in total to work through all the sort of content. The activities, um, the, the, the modules, if you will, in the course are very much sort of video based. Uh, they're very much sort of focused on our lead educator, uh, Professor Alan Gore, who takes the uh, individuals through this sort of four weeks of journey to bring alive the process of clinical sort of research. And when we started the, the course, we offered it in a very much a cohort model. So the, um, there was a waiting list, people sort of signed up and then three times a year, we ran the course when it was sort of available to people and it was very actively sort of moderated you know, during that sort of time. And then it closed again, there was a waiting list and we went through that sort of cycle three times a year. More recently, and based on the feedback that we got from sort of participants, we moved to a, a sort of forever on sort of model where it is available throughout the year uh, it is sort of actively moderated in sort of waves, but there is sort of some ongoing moderation throughout the year. And we tend to reset the comments on an annual sort of basis. Uh, we work on the financial year. So if you do go in to look at this little link after today's presentation, you will find that it is very light on comments at the moment. But that is because we have just literally sort of cleared the deck in terms of the comments and restarted the course again. And, and this also really helps us for tracking uh, year on year for the statistics and the analysis that we do you know, to the course. On the screen now, you can see some of the feedback that we have received. Obviously, we've got a, a wealth of sort of feedback from you know, the 46,000 uh, individuals who've engaged with this, of course. What this illustrates here is that we are attracting particularly uh, those people who've got an, an interest in clinical research, in clinical careers, or maybe people who are already in a clinical role are looking to sort of understand more about the roles of clinical sort of research. So some fantastic sort of quotes that we've sort of enjoyed receiving from this sort of MOOC. I'm now going to say a little bit about the second MOOC that we launched. Uh, we launched this uh, in November 2019. And as you can sort of see there, the title is What is Health Research? And the reason that we decided to launch a second sort of MOOC was that the feedback that we were receiving is that um, it, it the original MOOC wasn't maybe focused towards meeting the needs of public and participants uh, fully in terms of really explaining to members of the public what it was like to partner with cl uh, clinical professionals in the processes of clinical sort of research. We took the opportunity to make this as a shorter course. So this is three weeks and it probably takes about three hours on average for an individual to complete each of the weeks so nine weeks in total. Uh, as I say, it's very much designed to walk in the shoes of members of the public, either participating in a research study or partnering with us in the design or dissemination of research findings. Since we launched it at the very end of 2019, over 6,000 learners have gone through enrolled on the course. And again, we are seeing sort of very favorable you know, ratings, 4.7 out of 5, as you can see there. And what we do see with this course is a significantly higher completion rate, which is something that I'll come on to in just a second. Just before we do, again, just a few sort of nice sort of quotes there from individuals who participated in the course. And maybe just one thing to pick up from this, uh, as well as members of the public engaging with the course, uh, what we have sort of seen, maybe we didn't fully anticipate it at the time, is actually we get a fair number of clinical professionals also going through this course, wanting to walk in the shoes of members of the public and really understand what does the research process look like from a participant's point of view? What are the types of questions that members of the public may have about a research study? So I'm, I'm really grateful to the work of colleagues, uh, Megan and her colleagues in the Digital Education Service for starting to really look at the analysis of how these MOOCs were performing. 
and that has given us great insights for firstly the iteration with the what is health research MOOC but also as we consider moving into the next iteration of the MOOCs and particularly the uh, improving healthcare sort of MOOC you know, next generation. What you can see on the screen here uh, is the sort of first piece of analysis that the Digital Education Service did looking at the uh, improving healthcare through clinical research MOOC and it was to look at how many people were posting your know, comments and against which of the activities in the MOOCs were uh, which ones were triggering you know, the greatest response in terms of the number of comments and you see that in the top sort of graph and where we were running an activity that then sort of raised the question and invited people to put comments about what does the term respect mean to you uh, that was one of those sort of activities that did engender lots of you know, comments being posted into the MOOC. Uh, what you can sort of see in the bottom uh, is, is analysis for how much the comments were, how long the comments were, how many words people were using. Again, as a bit of an indication as to how people were engaging with individual activities through the MOOC. Now, of course, we don't need individuals, uh, learners going through the, the course, postings sort of chapter and verse against every activity. But I think what this analysis really helped us think about is actually which activities and the phasing of the activities uh, are likely to trigger that greater engagement. And through that greater engagement, can you then retain people and encourage people to move through the whole of the course rather than maybe just sort of dipping in and out of components of the course? And this slide really sort of brings that alive as we look at that comparison between the improving healthcare. Uh, which is the first row and the uh, what is health research uh, which is the sort of second row uh, and on the screens in terms of the graphic sort of representation of the number of people that we retain within the course uh, as you can see on the left the improving healthcare on the right what is health research sort of MOOCs we did this analysis over a similar sort of period of time so that's why you see that there's 27,000 enrollments rather than the full 46,000 enrollments in the improving healthcare sort of MOOC so three things that we took from this sort of data. Firstly, by being quite targeted with the What is Health Research MOOC, targeting that towards members of the public, uh, you see that the number of active you know, activations, people who really enrolled and started to get involved with the course, you know, it is significantly higher. Uh, and that is obviously a trend that is then retained throughout the MOOC. Secondly, in the purple sort of text, looking at the comparison of the figures throughout the sort of stages, the number of people that we retain through 25%, 50%, and then 75%, all sort of marginally higher, but obviously it adds up to a, an overall sort of completion rate, which is sort of significantly sort of higher. Uh, and that was partly using that analysis about where do we put those prompts around engaging people, asking them to sort of write comments, asking those provocative sort of questions. And putting a lot of those maybe a little bit earlier on in each of the three of the weeks uh, of the presentation and then finally um, one thing is that kind of always sort of surprises a little bit when we looked at the improving healthcare MOOC was the very low um, completion the fully completed stats you know the 7.8 percent that you sort of see there on the screen but really it is that very last sort of step and we probably overcomplicated the end part of the course in that respect and so by simplifying the end of the course, it allowed us to give probably a much more uh, representative sort of view as to how many people were working through the complete sort of course all the way through from sort of beginning to end. And you see that with the much higher figure in the What is Health Research, the second MOOC there. So final bit of analysis that I'll cover and then hand back to Sir Megan to uh, talk about just this analysis, but also then comparing it with the other MOOCs that are run within the Digital Education Service. And we looked at the demographic data uh, and as you can sort of see on both courses um, most of our learners are female uh, we are attracting a large number of individuals in that sort of age group of 26 to 35 and individuals who are working full time but when you dig into a little bit more detail unsurprisingly the what is health research MOOC which is attracting members of the public we see a much larger number of people who are retired or not working um, and sort of obviously, likewise, that correlates to a slightly sort of higher age range. Uh, so that wasn't a surprise, but again, I think it helps illustrate that we are targeting that MOOC towards a particular demographic. So with that, I'll hand back to Megan. And um, if there's anything you want to say about these slides, but then certainly please go on and talk about how you did that analysis comparing the MOOCs that were running within the NHR 
with that wider portfolio that you run in the digital education service. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, so, I mean, John has, John's presented it very clearly, and I'll be brief to make sure we have some time for questions, but just to say that uh, it's very much part of the partnership that um, we've developed and, and maintaining with the NOHR and with others in terms of uh, obviously supporting the design and development of the courses in the first place, but then um, having an ongoing focus on the evaluation of um, the course performance and who the learners are and then uh, how they're engaging and what the impact is. Um, and uh, it's great to work with colleagues such as John who are so engaged with that analysis. Um, in terms of um, other, uh, other courses, so um, there, are, there are various different ways that we can compare the NIHR courses, um, either with other courses within our portfolio, but also uh, courses run by other providers on FutureLearn. So um, this slide uh, shows a comparison with other courses on FutureLearn, not just um, Leeds ones, but other ones in the, the health and medicine category, um, particularly thinking about uh, courses in the subject area of health research. So. First of all, just thinking about the uh, kind of health category, the performance, as, as John's already uh, talked about, of the both of these courses is, is good in terms of um, enrolments and then the uh, engagement and completion through. But as we've seen, um, the completion is much stronger with the what is health uh, research. Um, the higher enrolments on the improving healthcare through clinical research, but then a, a higher drop off rate. We then had a look at um, other courses on future then specifically in categories of, of health research and, and clinical research to identify what um, whether there were some kind of key characteristics of those courses which uh, were in common across the highest performing uh, courses in that category. And there we did see that the kind of hours of learning matched um, in terms of the, the 12 to 16 hours of, of learning across the whole course. There's a, there's a definite correlation between uh, the courses which are performing well in terms of enrolments and then and having uh, CPD accreditation, which is interesting given especially uh, with these courses where really the primary aim is public engagement and um, uh, knowledge transfer, but uh, there is still clearly that appetite for people to have um, have a badge or something that um, they can take away with them and especially for those learners who would be completing uh, that's where that badge would come into play um, and then uh, there did seem to be a trend towards courses that had a, a, a general research skills focus being uh, high performing again suggesting that although we're aiming these courses to public engagement as John's already said there is also the element of clinicians and others wanting to upskill themselves uh, as well, even through the What is Health research course in terms of understanding that um, research participant perspective. Um, some uh, sort of slightly speculative thoughts, I suppose, from the, from the team who have been, and I should say actually, um, that this I'm, I'm presenting this activity, but it is very much a team effort. We have a, a team within the digital education service who um, been leading on our insights activity, and, and this is very much their work. Um, uh, more recently, they've been looking at our courses across our portfolio, but including the NHR ones, and um, thinking about shifts in future learners model in terms of uh, how content is presented to learners, especially learners accessing courses for free without either subscribing or paying to upgrade for a particular course. We do see that most learners um, tend to skip kind of assessment content and introduction content and uh, are dipping kind of heading into the bits of content that they are most valuable to them and so some of the simplified design that John was talking about for the second course uh, kind of speaks to that. We're also seeing although this is very early because it's a recent change but um, future colleagues may be aware future then have recently shifted to uh, for, for learners accessing courses for free that content is um, uh, becomes available week by week so you can't kind of work through a full three-week course in one week unless you um, are subscribing uh, and that it does look like that might be having a negative impact on those free learners and their drop-off as you might expect and that's um, in terms of the where we've got courses where we do want uh, 
learners to subscribe or engage. It's not necessarily a challenge, but in the open education space, and in particular with these types of courses where the you know the real purpose is um, to engage as many people as possible um, in the health research and in that understanding, it does present a little bit of a, a challenge that we need to think about. So that's that's kind of something for us to think about going forward. Um, the other thing referenced on this slide is just John John mentioned the difference between the two courses in that the second course is shorter in length um, and just that that is backed up in literature in terms of that the sh uh, shorter courses tending to have a higher completion with higher retention and completion rates. So just an interesting comparison there. Um, just very quickly, so we'll make sure we run out of time. Um, as I say, we're keen to work in partnership with colleagues such as John on continued evaluation and there's a, there's a number of different areas that we want uh, to look at there. I won't go through the, them all. Um, in terms of our key insights, I, I will pass back to John in case there's anything he wants to add here, but it's really just um, that point that, well, uh, the active moderation John may want to say more about, but the, the learner preferences towards the kind of shorter courses and, and accessing the the content that is most relevant to them seem particularly important and that by paying attention to the completion rates but also those measures digging into where the where the engagement and the active participation is happening has really helped us with iterating uh, course design uh, and this has been a great partnership for us to be able to do that i'll just pass back to john for any final thoughts Th thanks, Megan. And just really to highlight that first sort of bullet that from day one, we went with a philosophy of actively moderating and respecting everyone who sort of put comments in. You deserve sort of a bit of a response. So our team of lead educators and moderators uh, trying to be as welcoming as possible, yeah, encourage as many sort of questions as possible, ensure that people feel that you know, there are individuals supporting that learner journey at all the points through the year. Uh, and I think we, one of those that's given us a lot of some good feedback that that, along with everything else that we're talking about, is part of the reason we're getting the um, the metrics that we are getting on these two MOOCs. Thanks, everybody. This is Maren again, the moderator. Thank you so much. Um, John, um, Megan, before we finish um, up the session, are you happy to take a few questions or did you want to just um, have a few more um, points um, or are you ready to take some questions? Happy to take questions, thanks. Fantastic, well, we've had a um, really good um, comments starting to come in through the chat here. So Paul is saying, really interesting talk. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question from Anna, Anna Page. So Anna says, it sounds like you might have to do bite-sized courses to get around that future learn barrier for those who are not subscribers. Um, did you want to pick that up? Um, which one of you wants to come in on that? I'll, I'll come in on that. Uh, John, do feel free to chip in as well. I, I think absolutely. Um, because of that stage release of content, if if the, if we really want to enable uh, learners to access for free um, and be able to access all of the content, then making it more bite size, you know, a kind of a week long, um, would be one way to do that. It then becomes interesting though, in that starts to you think to what extent is it a course or is it more a learning resource that might, people might need to be accessing, which itself could be fine. That might not be a bad thing, but there's some really interesting questions we need to think through there in terms of the design but yeah absolutely that's a really insightful thought thanks megan john did you want to come in on that i think just to add that you know, we, we fully understand that future learn have a platform to run they need to have a freemium sort of model they do need to think about the sort of the financials um you know, e equally, as Megan is sort of saying, that you know, we do want to ensure it's a great learner experience and people aren't so sort of frustrated if they do want to move through the full sort of course you know, quickly. Um, the other thing I'd sort of say is that we also educate people that the clock starts ticking 
once they've sort of subscribed to the sort of the course. So not to sort of sign up for the course, leave it a couple of weeks and then get frustrated that you haven't got the time to sort of complete the course. And I think that's really just about learner education. Mm. That's a really good point. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question. Um, this question is from Paul um, here in the chat. And he's saying, I was wondering if you're finding data that supports the shift to bite size in terms of student engagement or similar. So are you finding data that supports the shift to bite-sized in terms of student engagement and so on? Yeah, so we do, um, I mean, to be honest, the, ma the majority of the courses that lead on on future then are, are fairly bite-sized in terms of length, in, in terms of uh, kind of number of weeks and content. So the courses I mentioned, which are aimed very much at students or potential students kind of come into university uh, are all two weeks and kind of light content within each week kind of a couple of hours per week so that, so they are pretty bite size um, and that was a deliberate decision based on um, really wanting to it to be to get that engagement but to kind of uh, not demand too much in terms of uh, the engagement that really it was a it's a taster uh, and that's the, the kind of aim of the experience I guess the challenge is where um, for the particular audience or the purpose of the course that you're aiming for you re you're wanting to take people on a more in-depth journey it's then how we make sure that we can do that whilst retaining that engagement um in terms of the data um the the data i mentioned in terms of or kind of initial um indications based on the more recent shift is really just an initial indication we need to do some kind of proper work on that to, to make sure that that um, what seems to be happening actually is. So that's kind of work in progress at the moment. Thanks, Megan. That's really interesting. Um, so I think we're nearly at, at the end of our time. Um, but before we put our virtual hands together and give you both a big thank you, just any final comments from you, John, or you, Megan? Uh, I just firstly, yeah, thank you for everyone for your participating today, hearing, hearing what we have to say. And um, uh, just reiterate what I said at the beginning, if there are questions when people reflect on this or see the recording, we'd be more than happy to yeah, hear from people and our emails are on the screen at the moment. Thank you. Well, yeah, I would just echo those thoughts, absolutely. Well, thank you so much very much, um, for joining us here at OER 23. And thank you to everybody in the room. It's been a really thought provoking session this morning and the recording will be made available. But I'd also like to encourage all of you to head over to the Discord channel. There's a dedicated chat for today's sessions. So um, if you want to post slides in the chat there to share them, um, please also continue to follow the um, OER hashtag on social media and um, share your work. One more widely this way. Um, from everybody here at OER23, see you at the next session. And thanks again to our presenters um, for a really wonderful session today. So thank you very much, John. And thank you very much, Megan.